in a way, we're going to bring this class full circle by going back and talking a little bit about the alternative to developing a mobile website, and that is developing a native app. All right? And we're going to revisit it in terms of concept, and then we're going to go from there. And here's what my plan is, you know. We all know how plans work, right? But here's the, here's the plan. The plan, is, <laughs> the plan is today that we will talk about uh, this concept in detail. We'll talk a little bit about a tool. You'll spend some time investigating this tool, um, which is called PhoneGap. And you'll create a web page that works almost like a tutorial for this that, that will sort of tell you what it does, sort of tell people what it does and and uh, what you need to do and, and the advantages of doing it this way and so on. So that way, that will reinforce the stuff that we've covered in class, as well as giving you a chance to practice creating mobile web pages. Then, next week, we will try to actually take either that or the LC map, or both, and try to create native Android apps using uh, PhoneGap. So we probably will be in the lab next week. We'll be in lecture today for most of the night. Wednesday, I'm not sure. All right, so we'll play it by you. Yes? Is that a PhoneGap? Is that a run by the command prompt? Did I just give you a try yet? Uh, I have just played with a bit, a bit. There's supposed to be a web interface for it. Is there? Yeah. The last there, time I used it, Yeah, well, well, we'll take a look at it. We'll, we'll at least, the way I figure is this. I haven't had a chance to investigate it fully. I hope to do so over the next day or so. Um, but uh, at the very least, you should know what it, it's about and the options that are available. And if we can actually go ahead and do it, then then better still. All right, so at the very least, let's understand this because and, and, it's always an issue that comes up. All right, so... We have mobile web sites. And we have apps. And this is getting back to the first few weeks of class. We're kind of kind of gonna do a spoiler here. Alright? Because the answer is, and, and, and we'll come up with the answer first, and then we'll, we'll give the reasoning to kind of support that. Uh, the answer is an organization, an organization is probably going to want to cover all their bases. So an organization will probably have both these. It's like the old wearing a belt and wearing the suspenders, right? Just to be really sure you got everything covered, all right? Uh, you don't want to leave anyone out in the cold. And we'll talk about why you would want to do that. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll contrast the differences between these two. What languages are mobile websites created in? HTML. Yeah, HTML. So maybe HTML5, CSS, maybe some JavaScript, maybe some pieces on the server side. Bottom line is these are standard languages. All right. The idea of a standard is that if, if, if some entity is going to enforce that standard or follow that standard, then you can communicate with any other entity. So, for example, um, telephones, you know. There's some protocol by which telephones talk to each other. As long as both of the telephones on both ends of the transaction know that protocol, they can communicate with any telephone in the world. All right? Um, likewise with web pages, conventional fixed desktop web pages. As long as the, H, the browser supports HTML, then it can access any web server and view any web page in the world. That's the promise, anyhow. So that's a good thing, the standards, all right? What languages are apps written in? Java. All 
All right, for Android apps, they're written in Java. For iPhone, they're written in Objective-C. Well, right off the bat, there's a problem, right? Let's imagine if you're an organization that wants to develop everything, all right? You want to have a mobile website so people can access your information on the web. But you also have heard people talking about apps, and you want to do a de uh, uh, develop an app. It's not necessarily easy to find a person or a team of people that is experts at all of these technologies. All right? It's pretty rare. All right? I would say, at least at this point uh, in the game. So therefore, if you have to cover all the bases, if that's the conclusion that we're coming to, all right? And we'll talk a little bit why we're coming to that conclusion. But the very fact of having a variety and a wide range of skill sets required makes that task a little bit daunting, all right? It also makes it daunting the fact that, you know, instead of, you know, one times the effort, you might have three times the effort, or maybe even four times the effort, right, when you consider the conventional fixed websites. I just saw that term over the weekend, fixed web, for what I've been calling desktop versions of websites. So by covering all your bases, that's a lot more work for you. It would be great if you could just do once and not worry about it. And in fact, that's sort of the promise of the standard, right? The iPhone and Android phone all should be able to handle HTML, all right? Um, why not do everything in mobile websites then? Why develop apps then? If the promise is that, hey, I only have to write it once, iPhones, desktops, Androids, why bother developing apps? Um, as I understand, that they, some of those apps can take advantage of features only found on that particular ah, okay. Number one is apps, because they're written for a specific platform, can take advantage of features of that specific platform. That's one thing you don't get with, uh, with, with standard HTML, right? It's kind of like the, you know, one size fits all, go to the store and buy a hat, or go to the store and buy a, a pair of slippers or shoes, one size fits all versus having something made custom for you. You know, it can fit your needs a lot more precisely if it's made just for you. Likewise, if it's written for a specific platform, it can take advantage to, uh, of the features of that platform that you don't get with the standard package, right? Because with the standard, you're trying to, you're writing in a way to the lowest common denominator, right? And therefore, you're not necessarily able to take advantage of all the uh, features that a device may have. Now we've seen things around that are worthful, which we didn't get to work completely, but that has a promise of being able to detect some features of the phone and, for example, turn on a link for dialing the telephone versus that. But we can do even more if we go to a native application. What's another reason we might want to do it? There's not necessarily a technical reason. Another reason we might want to create an app that's not necessarily a technical reason. Is easier use a technical reason? Um, easier use I would still consider a technical reason, but that's a great example. All right? It's generally speaking easier to use apps for people than it is to use a mobile web. Because, again, if I go, if I download CNN's mo uh, mobile app, all right, a native app, I can have it, a button I can click and get the headlines. Compare that to, all right, a, someone that has to fire up their web browser, either has it bookmarked or has to enter the URL, and then go to that page. You know, it sounds funny, you know, but it's sort of like, you know, when you're sitting there waiting for your burrito to, to go in the microwave and it takes two minutes for it to cook, you're starting to get really impatient, you know. Same idea with that. It's much easier to click a button and have your app fire up 
as opposed to going through all the steps necessary to pull up a web page. And again, that, that kind of sounds funny, and that kind of sounds like, as they say, a first world problem, all right? But that's the world in which we're in, that we can make the web is sort of the Wild West out there. You have access to anything, you can go anywhere and all that. The app is written to be very focused on one piece of functionality and to get you to there very quickly. So easier, and we'll say more focused. So that's a reason for doing it as well. Any other reason we might want to do it? For non-technical. Just on a sheer speed? Share speed. Well, that would be a technical reason, but uh, how so? Uh, I, well, uh, with uh, mobile pages, you have to once again load everything up, all the pictures, all the text. Is, you know, okay. Kind of a, like you said, waiting for the burritos. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a section of the one chapter I think we skipped about giving some sort of uh, caching, so that you could do some things offline, uh, but. It's much easier to do stuff that's offline. If it's a mobile web page, you know, the fully functional version of it is going to need to be online. Whereas this, you can do some things offline. So yeah, that's an advantage. You know, think of my to-do list. I have a to-do list on my phone. My data is on my phone, right? Uh, if I were to go to their website, I would have to connect to the web and download that. Well, what if I don't, I'm not getting a good connection if, the, if the, the 3G network is down or I'm in a, a goofy spot, you know, where I'm not getting good uh, reception. Won't be able to access the mobile page to get my um, to-do list, but if I'm viewing on a native app, that data lives on my phone and maybe is synced online, in which case I can view it. Another reason. I would just say purely from a marketing perspective. You know, chances are when you're growing up at, at some point in time, you know, I remember when I was growing up, the, the cool bicycles were the ones with the long banana seat and the big handlebars that came up like this and you know and, and the big bar in the back and every kid wanted to have one and the, the most persuasive argument that every kid used in trying to convince their parents to buy them one is that all the other kids had one right it's that kind of peer pressure right you don't want to be the only kid that has a a, 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 a lame bicycle with the handlebars that are like this instead of like this and a regular seat instead of a banana seat now those old school bicycles are, are, are a lot more in fashion these days, you know, but anyhow, uh, I digress, all right? There is sort of a corporate kind of peer pressure, all right, that you want your organization represented if people go out and look for an app from it, all right? You want to be able to say, yeah, we have a mobile app. Even if the mobile app doesn't do much, it's good to be able to say that. And you can provide it, and you can get some sort of functionality out of it, and it's a way to increase your company or organization's visibility. So think of it as a form of corporate peer pressure. All right? This is much like it was in the early days of the web, right? In the early days of the web, everyone had to have a website because everyone else had a website. Well, it's almost the same thing with this. When a new thing comes out, you don't want to be left behind, and you don't want your organization to have the perception that they're behind the times. So you want to have a mobile application. All right. The other thing is, it's unclear what the future is going to hold. All right. Will these two strategies exist on a parallel path? They certainly are now, right? Because we have both mobile sites and we have native applications. Will that continue to happen? Or will the tide turn one way or another? Who knows? So organizations are kind of hedging their bets, you know, <laughs> like organizations in uh, maybe the early 80s put out their movies both on VHS and beta, right, until it took a while for that to shake out and people figure out, no, this is the way we're going to go, 
right now we're still at the stage where these two things might coexist, or maybe the tide will turn one way or another. No one knows. And no one's willing to bet on it. <laughs> All right? And no one's willing to say, hey, I know that mobile sites are going to overtake that, so forget developing these native apps, or vice versa. All right? So for all those reasons, we get back to our spoiler at the beginning. You know, you need all of them. All right? Even though that's a drag for IT people, right? Because you got to do now maybe three times the work. All right? You have to have people with a variety of different skill sets that aren't necessarily easy to find. All right? Then you got to maintain it and all those sorts of things. So even though it's a headache, that's the way you have to go. Well, there is a technology here that can help, and that's called PhoneGap. All right? Let's consider, let's give an overview of what PhoneGap does, and let's consider some of the advantages and disadvantages of it. There's a good diagram in the book. Let me see if I can find the page that it's on. Three seventeen. They show on the one time you have your standards, your web standards, which is your HTML and your CSS. So you have your web standards. And you have a project developed. using those web standards. On the other end, you have different native platforms. And that can be, wow, that was a flashback. I almost, I almost put AOS VS, which is one of the first operating systems I ever worked on. Data General, I'm sure they're out of business these days. But wow, that would have been, yeah. We don't need to convert this to AOS VS, all right? But iOS, Android, Blackberry, maybe Windows phones, and so on. All right? As the name implies, this phone gap can serve as a service to translate your HTML, CSS code, in other words, your code using web standards, into native apps for different platforms. All right? It does this a couple different ways. It does this by, first of all, sort of translating. I'm just going to use HTML into the native code. And it does by provide and it also includes a framework for accessing um, device features such as a camera, etc. Now this almost sounds like a, um, this almost sounds too good to be true. What do you suppose the problems are with this strategy? Does this solve all of our problems? Probably not. All right. Do anything about the weather and anything like that, right? Where do you see this going wrong? Uh, if it's like foreign language, there's always something that gets lost in translation. 
<laughs> exactly. I don't know if you've ever looked. Sometimes they'll like they like show like movie posters that get translated from some language into uh, into another language and what it means. Or you know, on occasion, um, uh, for the, the, you know, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. You're probably all too young, but when Jimmy Carter was president, he was in Poland and. He said how he loved the Polish people. Well, the translator used the wrong verb, and it equated to he lusted after the Polish people. So, uh, so it's possible there's shades of meaning, right? There's shades of meaning in, in languages. Now, to be sure, natural languages are different than computer languages, but there's always a potential that a translation could go wrong and that it's not going to work exactly the way that you want it to, especially when you're mapping potentially to other languages. Other things that can go wrong. So, so one thing is, is it might not necessarily, you know, um, how, how do I, I want to say this? Yeah, it might convert it, but you better, you better go and test it and make sure that everything worked out okay. What's another potential downfall uh, fall for this? Other potential issue with this? Can you envision? Well, if we're thinking from a translation standard, how would I know to use things like its camera or its ability to dial a link? Well, I'm sure that's documented. Uh, I'm sure that's documented. That does raise an interesting point, though, and this is a point kind of that Joey alluded to. It might not be that easy. All right, we're drawing a box here, drawing arrows and drawing arrows out and being done. You had mentioned you had worked with it in the past, and it wasn't necessarily that straightforward. All right, so that could be one thing. It may actually be more difficult to <laughs> do that centerpiece than, than you might think. All right, so that's definitely a potential drawback as well. It's kind of like that Bezid website that says you could get um, you get a Mustang GT for ninety eight percent off, and you only pay like four hundred dollars for a new one. Really? Yeah. Do you ever see those commercials? I've seen commercials like that. All the products are like ninety to ninety nine percent off. Really? Someone got like a new Mac for like twenty three dollars. And what's the catches with those? Spam for life. I don't know. I'm not trying. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's kind of like this. It seems like. Yeah, you're, you're right. You, you should always be leery of claims of technologies until you've proven it for yourself. That's true. I mean, not that anyone's trying to rip you off here because yeah, it's free yeah. software, but you're right. It, it, it is reasonable to be skeptical about the claims. All right. Here's the other, uh, other potential issue. Let's assume that the translation is correct. All right. We had talked about the potential for being things that get lost in translation or mistranslated or however you want to put it. A lot of times, if, for example, if you read poetry that was translated from one language to another, all right, a lot about poetry is the sound of the words and the rhythm and all that. And if you're translating poetry, you might translate the words correctly, but you might lose something in terms of the words that flow beautifully in one language might be clunky in another language. All right? What's the analogy for code? Well, when you translate things like this in a mechanical way, you're not necessarily going to have the most efficient code. All right? And because of that, at some point, it might be better just to throw up your arms and say, you know what? Forget doing this, let's go and we'll find someone that can write an Android app to do this. So we find out someone that can do an iPhone app or whatever. So all those things taken together um, sort of lead you into saying that this is interesting. If it works for you, it's a, you know, it's a good, you know, it provides uh, benefits. But if not, then it could cause problems. So um, anything that... that Again, uh, Andrew brings a good point. Anything that sounds too good, you want to take with a grain of salt. All right? Especially, again, when you talk about translating. All right?
because the aim is for that translation to go smoothly, but you know that things like that are never perfect. And just like there are browser compatibility issues with web pages, there could always be some sort of translation issue baked into this framework uh, where it just doesn't work exactly the way that uh, you intended or it doesn't work efficiently. Might get the job done, but might not be great code. Now, let's assume that it doesn't do everything perfectly. It might still be worth using because then it might do 80% of the work for you, and then you have to clean up 20% of the stuff. All right? Which, hey, that's reasonable. You know, Maybe it doesn't do everything that you would like it to do, but if it can do a lot of your work for you, then that frees you up to do um, the cleanup work and make sure everything works. All right? Let's pull up uh, their website that talks about this. What I want you to do again is I want you to, to create a website about PhoneGap, sort of as a tutorial or an FAQ or an introduction, however you want to put it. And I want you to, to how do I want to say this? I want you to use a jQuery mobile, but I want you to design it. In other words, think of what would be usable. Think of the page that you would want to visit if you were learning about PhoneGap. Think of how you would want it designed. Because there are some things that we learned and some things that you could look up that would, would make for a much better user experience. So again, this particular assignment, you'll be graded on the content, but you'll also be graded on the design and how you put everything together in a, in a logical, use, uh, usable way. We're not, for this particular assignment, there's really no new technology involved. But we want to use all the technology to help create a page and again, in the act of coming up with the content, my hope is will further your understanding about uh, this phone gap. So let's go and let's pull it up. And let's see what the page says about it. Here's a little video that I hope we can see in here. sort of have my little diagram here. Now, this particular version of it allows you to download the code so that you can do this right on your machine. So you can download the framework to your machine. There's another uh, option as well, and that is PhoneGap Build. And what PhoneGap Build does is it lessens the load um, on your particular machine because it allows you to deploy a project, put a project out there, and do the compiling out without having a lot of stuff installed onto uh, your, your local machine. Adobe PhoneGap. So this was purchased by Adobe. You can sign up for a free account, all right, for this. So I'd urge you to do it just to, just to 